the effects change like this. When two ships run abreast, strong suction at the midships and bow outward moments are generated between them. The effects will be like this when the bow of ship A advances ahead of ship B, but one third to one quarter of their hulls remain parallel. The effect will be like this when the stern of overtaking ship A comes a beam of the bow of ship B. Let's look at how the interaction between two ships in close proximity and running in the same direction in a narrow channel affects the steerability of a ship through a simulation. This is the case in which ship A overtakes ship B in a narrow straight channel with a width of 310 meters. The two ships are similar and these figures represent the specifications of ship B. Ship A runs at 4.5 knots and ship B runs at 3 knots. The beam distance between the two ships is half of the ship length. The two ships are steered to maintain parallel courses. In this case, the length of ship A is 0.8 times that of ship B. Now let the lengths of the two ships be the same. Now let the length of ship A be 1.2 times that of ship B. As you can see in the results of the simulation, the interaction between the two ships is enhanced as the length of the overtaking ship increases. A collision occurs because the overtaken ship is pulled to the overtaking ship by suction when the ratio of the lengths of the two ships ranges around 1.2. Let's take a look at the effect of ship speed. In this case, the ratio of ship speed of overtaking ship A to that of overtaken ship B is 1.2, and the beam distance between them is half of the ship length. The two ships are steered to maintain parallel courses. The simulation is made by changing the speed of overtaking ship A, maintaining the speed of overtaken ship B at three knots. You will find that the risk of collision increases as the difference between the speed of the overtaking ship and that of the overtaken ship decreases. This is because the time when the two ships run parallel in close proximity is prolonged and the subsequent interference between the two ships lasts longer proportionally. As you can see in the results of the simulation, there is a larger interference effect on an overtaken ship when the difference of speed of the two ships is small and the overtaking ship is larger than the overtaken ship. It becomes difficult for a ship to avoid a collision through its own steerability when this interference grows beyond its capacity. It is particularly important to maintain safe navigation in restricted waters such as ports and narrow passages where maritime traffic is dense and the risk of accident is high. When ships are obliged to move close to each other in such restricted waters, cautious ship handling taking steerability of their own ships, the effects of interaction and interference between ships and bank effect into consideration are indispensable.
Recently, accidents that have resulted in losses of anchors together with the entire length of anchor cables have been increasing while ships were attempting to anchor. Accidents involving ships lying at anchor have also repeatedly occurred. Most of these accidents involve drifting, collision and stranding caused by dragging anchor. We will study how to prevent drifting due to dragging anchor while lying at anchor and loss of anchor and its cable while attempting to anchor. When anchoring is anticipated, it is essential for mariners to acquire meticulous knowledge on the anchorage beforehand and select a sheltered, good holding ground with an appropriate depth, depending on the ship's own manoeuvrability and conditions, taking weather and sea conditions, dangers such as submarine cables, as well as pipes and wrecks in the vicinity into consideration. It is necessary to have a clear plan on how to reduce the ship's speed from the approach to the intended anchorage and how many lengths of cable are to be paid out. A method of riding to a single anchor is the most frequent anchoring method. However, the anchoring method should be decided depending on weather and sea conditions and necessary preparations are carried out according to the selected method. The specifications of anchor and anchor cable to be stowed are decided by the equipment number of the ship. Each classification society also has its own requirements in compliance with this standard. Today, the AC-14 type anchor appears to be the most widely used, but there are various other types of anchor available. Let's look at the holding property of an anchor. The flukes of this type of anchor do not bite into the seabed as expected, and the anchor is easily overturned when stress is applied. What's more, once overturned, the anchor will never bite into the seabed again. These are the flukes of the AC-14 type. The AC-14 type is the most popular anchor today. It bites into the seabed well and remains stable without overturning when stress is applied. This curve shows the results of anchor pulling tests. Holding power is the resistance created by the anchor when it is pulled. The maximum resistance is called holding power. In addition to the holding power of the anchor itself, the effect of the cable paid out cannot be neglected. The total mooring power is the sum of the holding power of an anchor and the resistance of cable laid over the bottom.
Although the anchoring method varies depending on the depth of an anchorage, lying at a single anchor is most frequent because of its handling simplicity, either when dropping or weighing anchor. In this pattern, the anchor is usually let go under stern way. First, we look at the procedure for lying at a single anchor in an area with depths to 20 meters. It is important for the running out chain to be checked by proper brake handling after the anchor is let go by freefall releasing the brake. Letting go the anchor and the cable without applying the brake properly increases the danger of loosing the anchor with all of its cable and damage to the windlass. Sternway just after letting go the anchor should be adjusted 0.5 to 1 knot to avoid imposing excessive strain on the cable in large vessels. And the brake should also be screwed up to stop the cable when the required shackles are sent out and have the anchor fluke bite into the seabed under sternway inertia. Next, let's study anchoring at a deeper anchorage depth of from 20 meters to 50 meters. In a deep area, the possibility of loss of anchor and its cable becomes greater due to excessive running out speed if the anchor is let go by free fall. To avoid this hazard, the anchor is lowered by walking back into the water until it reaches about 5 metres above the bottom. Then the brake is released to let go the anchor, while applying the brake to adjust the running out speed of the cable and carefully maintaining proper sternway. When the depth of an anchorage exceeds 50 metres, the anchor and the whole cable required are laid down onto the seabed by the walk-back method. In this case, sternway should be maintained under 0.5 knots once the anchor has touched the bottom, because too large a speed difference between sternway and walkback may cause parting of the anchor cable or damage to the windlass due to excessive strain in large vessels. The limitation of depth for anchoring cannot be decided only from the total amount of anchor shackles and is limited by the rated capacity of the windlass. Generally, a windlass is provided with a weighing capacity of up to 3 to 4 shackles of cable, or about 82 to 110 metres. In an anchorage where the influence of winds and tideways are strong, there is a greater danger of dragging anchor due to excessive strain on the cable, otherwise due to the reduction of holding power stemming from a meandering cable caused by the effects of winds and tideways. Anchoring in wind at a wind speed exceeding 10 meters per second causes ship motions that draw a figure of eight locusts. The maximum tension on the cable during this motion occurs when the ship drops back from its extreme yaw to the position where her fore and aft align the direction of the cable against the wind, or a little offset point.
This moment may be deduced from the change of relative direction of the wind on the navigation bridge. The anchor drags when it loses its grip on the bottom and starts sliding over the bottom. For a PCC or an LNG carrier with a large windage area lying at a single anchor, the critical wind speed is 15 meters per second. When the second anchor is dropped, the critical wind speed is 20 meters per second. And even when the ship is lying at two anchors, the critical wind speed is said to be 25 meters per second.